Hi, I'm Sarah Petrus, and the title of my NHD presentation is Leading the Changes in Music, Claudio Monteverdi, Johann Sebastian Bach, Ludwig von Beethoven, and Arnold Schoenberg. You know, a lot of people think that music from 100 to 200, 400 years ago is boring, but that's certainly not the case. Back then, classical music was just music, and people listened to it like people today listen to pop songs. Music has changed a lot since then, though, and some people were opposed to those changes, but the leaders of them pressed on, making music what it is today. No movement is done by one person alone, but four people who led changes in music throughout the history are Claudio Monteverdi, Johann Sebastian Bach, Ludwig von Beethoven, and Arnold Schoenberg. All four of these people are from different time periods, but all four of them it led changes in music, music theory, and the concept of what music is. Let's start with Claudio Monteverdi, who lived in Italy in the, from the late 1500s to the early 1600s, during the time of the late Italian Renaissance. He's most famous for his opera, L'Orfeo. Giovanni Maria Trussi is a backwards fool. He means to tell me, Claudio Monteverdi, what I should and shouldn't compose. Oh, I guess that's the name of the music business. Many of the masses do like my works, but the complaints of, the compl of my critics can make me livid. So what if my music has more dissonances than others? It adds to the emotion in the lyrics of the piece. How can I play? This, during an angry, erratic scene, or even this, when it makes so much more sense, it provides so much more for the lyrics and the emotion to play this or this. This concept of using the lyrics to lead the music and the notes of the piece has been developed by, by, by my brother, Giulio Cesare and I, and we've called it the Seconda Practica. And another thing. Why is everyone so invested in polyphonic music, making every voice part carry the same weight as every other voice part? This is the renaissance, isn't it? Shouldn't we be celebrating the individual in song by making one melody stand out above the rest and be the most important? Well, opera is still a young art. Maybe I can change their minds yet. Claudia Monteverdi was right. Today, one melody rising above the rest and being the most important in a composition comprises of much of today's mu music. Dissonances, too, are used far more freely than they were in the 15 and 1600s, spanning across all the genres. Next, let's meet Lu Johann Sebastian Bach, who lived in Germany from the late 1600s to the early 1700s, the time of the Baroque music era. They call me a genius organist, but I compose as well as play, you know. I compose much for the church, for as I have said, the, the, the final end of all music should be none other than the glory of God and the refreshment of the soul. Words to live by, I think, and I intend to use my humble abilities for God. Some, I think, misunderstand. The Puritans, for example, for some reason think it is immoral for religious service and music to walk hand in hand. What nonsense! My fellow Lutherans get it. Others are baffled by my music in particular, my excessive use of trills and ornaments and such. This style of music, using many ornaments, is generally called the Rococo style, but we Germans call it the Empfindsame Still, or sensitive style. I also help develop what is known as the fugue, which works like this. You start by playing a melody, and then the same melody plays again at the same time as the first. Now, if you don't mind, I have to get back to work. I'm working on a new idea for a piece of music that can be played forwards or backwards and still make musical sense whichever way. I'm calling it the Crab Cannon. Bach's works were quite complex. His fugues and other compositions are fine additions for any music theorist and composer. 
If you've ever heard a choir sing around or canon, you know what I mean when I say that box works are alive and well in today's society. In fact, both of our next two composers, Ludwig von Beethoven and Arnold Schoenberg, both studied Bach's works, allowing themselves to be influenced by him. Let's start with Ludwig von Beethoven, who, who lived in Germany and Austria in the late 1700s and early 1800s. He is one of the most famous composers of all time, and he lived during the Romantic and Classical musical eras. To play without passion is inexcusable, I once said, and I'll say it again. To play without passion is inexcusable. Above all, music must be free, but the composer must also be free. Before me, almost all of the composers worked for the aristocracy, not playing for just for the sake of music. And I'm fed up with that. I demand respect from those for whom I play. Once, when I was conducting a concert, a nobleman had the gall to speak during the concert. I stopped and said, for such pigs, I do not play. to demand respect from the aristocracy and nobility, to being one of the first composers to write such emotional music, unprecedented, from, unprecedented, Beethoven truly was a revolutionary composer. His ideas on the treatment of composers and the emotion in musical pieces has survived to today. He was also criticized for his unique style of music and also for using too many dissonances. However, if we're talking about dissonances and atonality, Arnold Schoenberg will likely take the cake. He was born in Austria in the late 1800s and died in California, USA in 1951. This is as close to the present as we get, and by the time of his late adult life, the, moder the modern musical era had long been underway. My music is not for everyone. It requires a certain taste. Much of my music in my later career was atonal. That is, it had no key, si key center. There was no do, re, mi, mi, fa, sol, la, te, do. At first, audiences were not, did not like my pieces at all. And for the time being, I had to teach to make ends meet. However, I became quite the esteemed teacher, attracting the praise of none other than Gustav Mahler, a famous composer. However, my, my works began to gain ground among audiences, and I developed the most important concept of my career, the dodecaphonic method. It's a simple concept, but executing it well can be difficult. There are 12 notes in one octave. Play one note, then another, then another, but never the same note twice until you've finished all of the notes in the octave. In this way, a song is dependent not on a key center, but on a group of intervals. So you, there's no need to go between key, si key signatures, making things sometimes muddled. In a sense, this music was far more free, and it shook up the music theory world. It certainly did. It begged the question, what is music really? Is it a do mi so, or something more? Should music be solely for the church? Are lyrics the most important part of a song? Do ornaments have any real substance? What is a composer's place in the music world? And how does passion play into music? These questions may or may not have any definitive answers, but Arnold Schoenberg, Claudio Monteverdi, Johann Sebastian Bach, and Ludwig von Beethoven all broke new ground trying to answer them. They were leaders in music, making it what it is today and what it will be tomorrow.